Hi everyone, I am Seogyeong Ryu from KAIST and the title of this talk is Generating Executable Specification from Formal Semantics of WebAssembly. And Philippa already gave you a high level idea about our SPECTAC project and I'm going to um, touch on uh, some about it and then talk about this um, executable semantics. Uh, and this work is with our I mean, my students and all awesome people. I, you're going to see some pictures you've already seen <laughs> again. Okay, so all, everything started last March at the actual. Um, so someone here know me from JavaScript. And actually Christian was looking at me this morning and he was like, why are you here? <laughs> this is not about JavaScript. <laughs> Our group has been working on JavaScript for like 15 years and we are sick of it. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And Sam one day told me like, have you heard of WASM WebAssembly? That's really cool. You may want to apply your technique to WASM. And I was looking and he talked about this in a talk show, I think. And I looked at it and I just sent an email to Andres. Oh, I'm interested in this you know, talk show and I've never worked on WASM, but can I attend it? And he was like, yeah, bring your student as well. Oh, that's nice. And um, the, in the morning of the very first day, Andreas gave this timeline. And I was like, oh, very good. Because on that day, this afternoon, I showed this slide. This is about the history of JavaScript. Until 2015, there was just you know, one pretty big, let's say, 879 pages of the specification. And since 2015, the spec is released annually, every year. So like you know, Philippa and the other people who, including us, working on JavaScript, we need to read these 800 pages every year. Doesn't make any sense. So we were, um, uh, yeah, and this is the third Thursday of the dark show, yeah, and Conrad was taking a picture, so he's not here. <laughs> but you can see Andreas, Philippa, Mattia, Pierre, Joachim, Luke, who gave the first talk today, and my student Dongjun, and Sam. So we discussed this idea, and when I gave the presentation of this, um, and they start writing DSL, dif yeah, DSL for WASM. It was amazing. I was so happy to see. I have to really enlightened and happy to see this awesome language called WASM and awesome people who are working on this. So we were happy, and Andreas gave this keynote last year in September in ICFP. The title was as low level as possible, but no lower. And he showed this picture, right? Everyone in the previous picture with two more students of mine. Oh, and sorry. we've, sorry. it's okay. Yeah, I mean, and we've been happy with applying this. And as many of you already know, when you want to add something to this WASM standard, you need to provide four artifacts. The first one is formal specification written in LaTeX. And the second is, I mean, Andreas thinks this is the best. <laughs> but developers may not think that way, and they prefer some prose. So this is prose pseudo code description, and Andreas usually called that like COBOL style, or translation from this beautiful LaTeX to some prose specification. And not only these two descriptions, but also you need to provide reference interpreter in OCaml, and unit tests for the feature. So these all four artifacts should be provided. Then um, my students, our team has been working on everything for JavaScript in Scala. And now we need to uh, implement things in OCaml. And there are some new bits, but you know, they were happy to learn those things. And another thing is that the current status is that developers, they need to write and read and review differences of the versions or new features in LaTeX. And you know how LaTeX works, especially with errors. And it doesn't check anything for you, right? So Andres wrote this beautiful picture. And the beginning is this DSL, domain specific language. That's going to be the single source of truth. That's going to describe the semantics of WASM, only once. Then, out of that, we can generate LaTeX description. We can generate prose specification. We can even 
kind of generate interpreters. It's a meta-level interpreter. Uh, I'm going to talk about that later. So you can run Wasm code in the interpreter that's correct by definition, correct from construction. And then there are lots of mechanizations that Philippa already talked about, right? So this is the big picture. And we have very, yes? You had two check marks there, the line between them. Oh, four, four with two lines. Yes, thank you. So usually when you say semantics in prose, then we check that whether our interpreters or broad, whatever implementations or runtime implementations correspond to whatever set in the spec, I mean, in the specification. So that's kind of the correspondence check. Usually, let's say when you have a JavaScript specification and when you have JavaScript interpreter, then usually you check correctness of your implementation by running test code. Lots of test code. So this is like when you, when the two things, like implementations and pro specification says the same thing, then we say, okay, they are good. They are, you know, talking about the same thing. When you have LaTeX, then you usually check that with proofs, with mechanization. So that's what we call by this. And when we just describe the semantics using DSL once, then, and you generate those mechanization automatically, then that's gonna be correct by construction. Thank you. The one thing I don't understand is why you're um, comparing the tests with the pros backend when you compare the tests with the interpreter. Oh. <laughs> may, may, since I made the slide originally, maybe I can answer that. So the idea there was like, um, usually when you have a language definition, right, that's just some text, maybe some LaTeX, um, how do you know that if you mechanize it or if you implement it, that is in any relation to what was there in textual form? Here, that is by construction because it all gets generated from the single source of truth. So whenever you prove something about your implementation run the test suite or do proofs about the mechanization, doing real proofs in Cork, then this actually gives you some assurance about what actually appears in the in the printed spec, right, as well, because it all comes from the same thing, and they really correspond to each other, and you know that because it's a mechanized construction, not something you kind of translate it by hand and just have eyeball correspondence on. That was kind of what this tried to right, so we convey. Right, the cock theory there and the latex will be the same thing. Yes. But why would we know that the test suite will be the same thing? It's more so, like... Basically, what is called AR there is some internal representation in this tool. So it's kind of like a compiler-like tool pipeline. And that's called the algorithmic representation. And that's what we generate the pros from, right? So it's basically an abstract syntax tree for the pros. And that's also what the interpreter interprets. So the interpreter, this meta-level interpreter, interprets the same thing that is then kind of pretty printed in the actual spec. So when that succeeds against the test suite, then basically it means that what is in, written in the spec succeeds against the test suite. Ah, I see. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Future reference, would you guys want to pass the next one? Uh, oh, sorry. oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Same. Sorry yeah. No, 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 no. So again, so this blue background is done by Andreas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's from his keynote talk of ICFP9. Yes? Could you explain that AR is not <laughs> so the question is, AR is not Andreas Rosberg, it's algorithmic representation. Thank you, Ben. Okay, so we wrote a very brief four-page description of this big vision, Wasm SpecTech, engineering a formal language standard. It's available as archive. And our team has been working on this algorith algorithmic part, as Philippa already said. I'm gonna show you the picture later again. So this is all based on our experience with JavaScript. So this was published at ASE 20, 2020. And again, we started with this ECMAScript, the prose specification of JavaScript. It's written COBOL style, the semantics of JavaScript. One, do this. When you have E1 plus E2, number one, evaluate E1, get the value, call it N1. Number two, evaluate E2, get the value, call it N2. Three, evaluate N1 plus N2 and return it. It's more like pseudocode, but one difference, maybe one of the many differences from Watson spec is its big step. 
big step semantics using the values at more high level. Um, but uh, we can discuss the difference later. So from this specification, we extract the semantics automatically. So actually, we generate the parser and the interpreter from the mechanized specification and generate the whole tool set. So this is an excerpt from the reviewer number three. Reviewer C from this in the paper, he said, can you possibly go backwards and generate the documentation from your derived model, right? That way, the documentation can be more precise and the standards committee can use your model to design new versions of the language. I believe that this is the right order to design and document languages. First, the semantics, then the implementation and documentation, ideally generated from the semantics. So this reviewer, yeah, since saw the future. And we wanted to do this from 2020, but there were so many JavaScript bugs not even going to this direction. So we had all lines of tools from GSET. So as soon as we have mechanized the spec of the JavaScript semantics, we could generate test data, a lot of test data to find real world bugs in JavaScript engines from major browsers. And because the usual coverage metric is not enough to generate lots of test data for language semantics, we um, have more specific test coverage for language semantics. And we also generated a static analyzer from the spec and what's the and type analysis of the specification and things like that. So we've been happy with this JavaScript work and even our work has been officially integrated into TC39. So now every future feature of JavaScript is now running our tool, the spec checking and test generation. So that's all good. But the thing is, as Philippa said before, students graduate, right? The main student, Ji Hyuk Park, is now an assistant professor at Korea University. And now that he's a, an independent researcher running a team, we were like, okay, you can take a, the JavaScript work. And anyway, we are, we are you know, sick of JavaScript and we are looking for a new target. And then again, Sam introduced Wasm to us and we moved to WebAssembly. And now JavaScript is with GX team. Then Wasm semantics in the specification. As you know, it also has formal semantics and prose specification. Again, um, this one is binary operator again. Then let's look at it. Number one, assertion. Wasm has validation, static semantics, unlike JavaScript. Number two, pop the value from the stack. We were like, my students were like, what is stack? <laughs> pop. Number three, pop the value from the stack and do this binary operation. If that's defined, then do this, otherwise trap. What? So it, Wasm was really different from JavaScript. So we had to understand this semantics and the former specification is the usual Greek letters, right? So, okay, we are happy with this. So let's compare this JavaScript and um, Wasm. As Philippa said, it's the inverse order. With JavaScript, we started with this formal, I mean, prose specification and generated some mechanized specification. And as Andreas explained really well, the semantics is represented in some DSL. For JavaScript, we call that IR, Intermediate Representation for ECMAScript, IRES. So the semantics in the ECMAScript spec like evaluate E1, get the value N1, call it N1. All those things are now described in IRES. And when we interpret the semantics, that's gonna be an interpreter. So when we get the JavaScript program and that the interpreter, the meta level interpreter is automatically generated from, I mean, we generate, we wrote the interpreter of the IR, then that's gonna be an interpreter for JavaScript. Right? Then um, we also generate parser automatically. So those things are all automatically generated. And we get the result. But with Wasm, that's the other way around. Now, Andreas wrote the DSL. That's going to be the single source of the truth again. 
and the WASM semantics is going to be written in DSL. Okay, so with this WASM 1.0 and 2.0 and now 3.0, so Andreas rewrote the semantics previously written in LATEC to DSL, right? Then we generate, we can generate a parser as well, but we didn't. Why, why should we do? Because it's already there in the reference of Camel Interpreter. So we reuse that. But we generate this AL Interpreter. We extract the semantics from DSL to our algorithmic representation. That's going to be DSL to algorithmic representation compilation. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Then we have this AL interpreter, and that's going to be the whole thing about algorithmic part. So, so now we are finally kind of achieving the goal that VBR number three envisioned in like four years ago. First, the semantics of WASM in the DSL, and then generate the implementation and documentation from the DSL specification. So our dream now came true. So again, here is the, I'm going to show that white small box later in a bigger font. So that's the semantics of binary operation in DSL. And Andreas also wrote parser and checker for DSL. Remember, if you write the semantics in LaTeX, if you missed some argument, if you have some typos, LaTeX doesn't find or doesn't check it, just, you know, make some errors, right? Or just generate some PDF with the errors. But now that we can have the semantics as a data, right? We can check it and we can do some more an analysis on that. That's all IR. So if our repository is available, so you can see that in the actual implementation, there's EL and IL and various levels, but you don't need to know about it. We call it just DSL and algorithmic representation AR, right? Then Andreas also wrote <laughs> this later backend. So we call these backends because the semantics is written once and all the others are automatically generated. So LaTeX backend, prose backend, interpreter backend, and mechanization backend. So here, because the designer of DSL made that way, the translation from DSL to LaTeX is very close, one-to-one -one correspondence almost, right? So you can have this DSL in this operation semantics way. And this is our AR, algorithmic representation. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. From this, we can generate this prose specification, and we can also make some tests. So again, this is that small, the top small white box. That's this. This is DSL, describing the semantics of binary operation. Here we say, hmm. So it's a binary operator when you have C1 and C2 and binary operator, then if binary operation has some value, then you have this semantics. If not, there is a trap. So there are two versions of the semantics. And this one is going to compile to LaTeX, then you're going to have this LaTeX backend showing this. Right? So this one is automatically generated from this DSL. Now one thing to note is that if you look at this, these are just if conditions. In, when you write some operation semantics, you have some conditions or premises in inference rules, right? So it, this one says if binary operation of C1 and C2 and its result is C, it, run, it evaluates this operation, get the result, and compares the result with this C is equality checking, right? And then the, this one just says binary operation doesn't have a value. So I'm going to show that more clearly here. <laughs> this is our algorithmic language. This is just the same with these four lines in more complex to human eyes, but simpler to the interpreter or spec generator. 
it says, hey, I'm, this is the semantics of binary operator, and assert, pop, assert, pop. Now you can see why we made this way. As Andreas designed DSL close to operational semantics, we designed AL close to the pros specification of WASM. So this is different from IRES. Because with ECMAScript, again, there are big step semantics, they are more high level, they use lots of auxiliary functions. If, if you ever looked at JavaScript semantics, just one simple evaluation of one expression requires like 10 auxiliary function calls, right? But WASM is different. So we had to, you know, say, you know, design this AL nicely capturing the way of WASM spec style, but at the same time, we should be able to generate interpreter and prose specification. So, oh yeah, let's look at these two if expressions. The first one is now, hey, um, evaluate this one, and then let's, go, let's give the value C, right? One more time. So when you have this application of binary operator, you have this C1 and C2, and this is binary operator, get the value and call that C. And here, when you have this binary operation of C1 and C2, and that does not have any value. So they are differently compiled. Previously, they look just the same with if expressions, but now one is using lip binding, and the other is using comparison. So there are little de those details. And this is generated prose specification from this AL. So from this, you can compile one by one. The assert pop, assert pop, it now goes to assert pop, assert pop. An if expression with two different compilation of if expression in operation semantics. One with lip binding and using that, and two with just the comparison. So based on how that's going to be used, they are compiled differently from DSL. One single DSL instruction is compiled differently in AL. Okay, so far so good. So I'm not going to go into the details of how to compile them, but really high level, when you have these kind of inference rules, DSL describes the inference rules really closely. So it says there's a left-hand side to right-hand right -hand side. There's the inference, I mean, rules from left to right, and there may be some optional premises. Then how do we compile them to AL? LHAs usually pop, pop, pop from the stack and give them names. And right-hand side is usually do the computation and push the value onto the stack. And in the middle is gonna be the premises. It's really high level. And when you get to the compilation, then there are more details. So when we are done with this compilation, we wanted to check whether the generated meta-level interpreter works correctly corresponding to the specification, right? The semantics written in DSL. So we checked the official um, test suite. We tested the extracted semantics against the official WASM unit test suite with this, on this machine. And the extracted semantics passed all the tests, SIMD excluded, in the test suite in 21 seconds. So SIMD, we thought, I mean, we think it's not that difficult, but a lot. Right? A lot. So we excluded SIMD instructions and just to have some you know, high level idea about whether this, work, this idea works, we tried it and it worked beautifully. So wow, that's good. So we recruited three more undergrads. <laughs> so Suyan and Ho Sung, two undergrads, they were busy implementing SIMD instructions. And as you know, it all started last March, less than a year then you can see the code is not going to be pretty, right? And you may know that Andreas has high, <laughs> high criteria for code quality, I think. So um, when he does some code review, my students are like, 
<laughs> and very grateful. <laughs> and also, I mean, they are learning a lot, but it takes time, right? So what we uh, wanted is that, again, Dong Jun is, he's um, one of my PhD students, he's really quick. And as Andreas wrote the DSL during the doctoral week, Dong Jun just started writing the interpreter and AL definition from that week. But his code is quick and dirty. <laughs> so, um, he, Hyun Hee, uh, the third undergrad, she is now joining us for code reviewing and refactoring. She is impressive. Um, one minute for that, you know, something really different. She studied drawing when she was a high school student, and she wanted to do something cool using arts. And she realized that um, art school doesn't teach her how to make that more scalable. So she started to go to a college in the second year of high school, and she studied hard. And KAIST is one of the best school in Korea, but she entered KAIST. Even without, I mean, with less than two years of studying. And she studied industrial design at KAIST, and she quickly realized that um, computer skill is needed. And she studied computer science in the third of, uh, year of her undergrad. And she went to an intern, and she realized that code quality of the real world developers is really low. <laughs> so um, without any guidance, she looked up. The clean, clean code textbook, and she read it while she was an intern. So when I heard the story, you should work with us. <laughs> <laughs> so now Hyunhee just joined, and she is cleaning up the code of Dongjun, uh, Wonho, and Jaehyun. I am so happy. So they are working hard, and now the current status is that they are done with writing the semantics of SIMD instructions, syntax, validation, and execution, everything. So that's all done, and they are reporting minor, minor spec errors and getting some approval. And they also automatically generated LaTeX and PROS specifications for SIMD, and with the official WASM unit test, 86% um, passes. The remaining 14% um, percent may due to um, their our way of describing the semantics, we may need to change the DSL, but I don't think so. We will see. And um, IL to AL translation and interpreter. Um, as you can see, whenever we have some decision making, we looked at the current WASM specification and its way of describing the semantics and just followed it. But maybe that's not the best way to describe the semantics. That's a way that we chose, I mean, not we, WASM people chose in the beginning. So that's the thing that we are currently working on. And when we worked on this methodology, like in a spec tech, the nice picture, why spec tech? Um, there are many language frameworks like K and plt Redux, OTT, and many others, right? So we did not want to you know, invent a new, and we looked at K, and there were two repositories, one, one, one repository for WASM semantics in K, and two repositories for WASM semantics in PL2 Redux, and all of them didn't really work. I mean, they were incomplete, and we um, have some discussion with internal people in K and PL2 Redux, and realized that they are not well suited for this uh, this style of semantics. I mean, K and PLT Redux, they have their own pros and cons. And SpecTech also has its own pros and cons. So it's not like one is the best and the other is wrong. It's more like they have different application domains, I think. So K and PLT Redux, they are rewriting engines, and they do not have algorithmic way of describing the semantics. They may, yeah, they don't, just don't, they don't. And um, our spec tech, we want to have this prose specification with algorithmic, you know, stepwise semantics. That's one thing. And now that we have this mechanized specification, we can generate test data. Wow, when we gave this presentation, it was in, um, CG meeting, uh, developers came to us like, when can we run your code, uh, run your tool so that we can test our implementation? We have these 
the errors that we wanted to catch earlier, and most of them were about CMD. So at that time, you were like, oh, sorry, CMD excluded. <laughs> 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 and now we have CMD, like one, 14 percent left, but I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be done by the end of January. So then we can finally help them work on that. So back to this JavaScript word, word because again, um, not the others, mechanization, that's all Philippa and Sam and Conrad and other smart people. We are about this algorithmic part because we've been working on JavaScript in that way. So now that we have this kind of thing, we have Wasm DSL designed by the king of Wasm, <laughs> and we can just trust that. If not, we can blame him. <laughs> That's not us. And based on that single source of truth, now we can generate all these tools. So the first target is test generation, just like we did with JavaScript. So uh, then, and the technical detail about Jest is what? From this mechanized specification in Wasm, that's going to be the Wasm semantics in DSL, we can generate Wasm programs, right? And not like randomly. We, can, we know the syntax, we know the structure, we know the semantics, and we know which part of the semantics is well tested by the official test suite. We know weak points. We have everything, right? So that's going to be the usual thing. We can generate programs from seed, and we can inject assertions because we know the semantics. And then we can have some mutator of the programs that's going to be guided by coverage metrics. Then we can find some errors in existing implementations. So that's West. So Jest is JavaScript engines and specification tester. West is Wasm test generation. So this is what uh, we are working on right now. Dongjun is working on this. Now the undergrads are work cleaning up his code. <laughs> so we built a Wasm fuzzer framework. And for Wasm 1.0 to 3.0, we can generate this .wast uh, Wasm test files automatically from the semantics written in DSL. And now for 2.0, we check that generated Wasm modules are all valid. So in the beginning, only 0.1% was valid. <laughs> so we had to add more stuff to filter out invalid modules, but now it's pretty high. And we can generate 10,000 tests in several minutes. And we found two minor bugs in some implementations already. And um, we measured the spec coverage of these 10,000 tests. It covered 100% excluding memory the copy and table copy. Um, there are some issues, I think, in our implementation. Don't worry. <laughs> We're going to look at it. And we are looking at it. Another thing is that even uh, with JavaScript as well, the JEST paper was published in ICSI. Uh, because it found really many errors. But we knew that there are more, but our JEST didn't find them. So we had to invent new kind of coverage metric for language implementation. Language semantics checking, testing, is different from program testing. Let's say that. If you're interested, you can look at PLDI paper. So here, we already see that, oh, the current metric is not enough to check WASM semantics. Um, we have some bug reports from WASM runtime implementations, and we are pretty sure that our naive current West implementation cannot catch them. So we are looking at advanced coverage or guided uh, test mutation in that word. And then we are going to find some bugs in modern runtimes. So this is the current AL. If you look at this AL description, there's one-to-one -one correspondence in sentences in WASM spec. So we started from, actually, what Dongjun did in, the first, in that doctoral week is to collect all the sentences in the Wasm specification and translate them to IR, and then compile them, and then simplify that. That was the first dirty hair. <laughs> then we, he covered 100 person like in a week. But that's not pretty, and that's not like actual core semantics of Wasm semantics. So we had to revamp that. And, this is the current version, but is this AL general purpose enough? Not really, because it's different from ECMAScript. 
And another question is, uh, this is this is the interpretation, I mean, DSL for ECMAScript, very tiny. And it's really high level. It uses lots of function calls. It's just like ML-like functions to describe the semantics of JavaScript. So JavaScript language itself is really weird and not good, <laughs> but the semantic specification of JavaScript is pretty nice, right? So um, I think this is the final big picture <laughs> of our group. When you write a grant proposal <laughs> in Korea, we, we usually write this kind of picture. I mean, draw this kind of picture. Maybe same here, I don't know. So my grant proposal says that, you know, there's natural language specification for various languages. And we'd like to have this general purpose mechanized spec. In the proposal, I said that there's going to be one general language specification, but not really. Now that we think about it, again, this JavaScript and other languages are big step. WASM and other language semantics are small step. And they are, some languages are more low level, like manipulating stack. And some languages do not know about stack, but it, take, it needs to take care of some other high level bits, concurrency, and all that. So I don't. Um, believe that there's one single <laughs> language, but we'd like to ha understand this better. Currently, we have only two instances, JavaScript and WebAssembly. And our grand vision is to have many languages. And well, another target is P4. As you know, P4 is this you know, language for network switching. And uh, um, so last year at PLDI, they foster came to me and like someone told me I should talk to you. <laughs> and there it's because P4 also has a specification written really nearly natural language. It does describe some semantics, but not really precisely or I don't know. Um, so we looked at that and it's a whole, whole new world. <laughs> so we are not um, committed, we have not yet committed to it, but when you write a proposal, you can save whatever you want, right? <laughs> so, um, P4 is just one of the latest language. Um, so Java, we only did JavaScript, and we are working on WASM, right? And um, we'll see. And the whole, this tool, tool generation is not, on, not like unique to us. Again, K does that, um, other cool language framework, manipulation frameworks do that. So w what we are trying to do is that language semantics, that's going to be the, again, I, I, I'm speaking this too often, but the single source of the truth. And as a language designer, we do like to describe the semantics in a crisp way, in a precise way, so that interpreter implementations and those developers, whatever, in what sense of devel developers, they need to read only one thing and understand it and do other things. And <coughs> JavaScript spec is released every year. WASM is growing. And whenever you grow your language, you need to do this manually again. So all we say is that it's not really technically complex. We do not use lots of Greek letters. All we say is that if each language or, yeah, language has its own DSL, right? Write for its own semantics and describe that. And the other artifacts can be automatically generated. Then the lives of developers are going to get much easier. <laughs> That's our hope and belief. And WASM is our second instance. And this was a very happy and lucky experience to us because working on JavaScript for the last 15 years um, was not that um, pleasant. <laughs> but working with this WASM community and people is really impressive. And the high level standard of the way the specification was written and the implementation uh, is manipulated. And uh, that's all really high level and well organized. And we are happy to work on this thing. And this is all possible by all the WASM community. So our bit is, I think this is the last slide. Yeah, our bit is that algorithmic part. And everything is possible by the semantics in DSL. 
because they all started from the semantics. Okay, this is what we've been doing, and thanks for listening. So there's lots of great work on generating interpreters, talking about how to generate interpreters. So the step beyond that, how are we going to think about generating compilers? We cannot generate type checkers <laughs> yet. And, and actually, after, after this talk, um, John, John Hughes, after, not this talk, after Andreas keynote talk at ISFP, there were so many people asking questions to Andreas. And um, during the talk, Andreas was, was like, oh, Sogyong's team is working on this implementation. Sogyong, how much percent? And I said, 100%. And um, after that, his talk, everyone was asking the questions to him. And John came to me and asked, like, can you generate type checker? <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> we are only, I mean, the spec implementation, the uh, interpreter is really nicely specified in prose. And we were just compiling that to AL. And type, type semantics is also written in prose, but in a very different way. Well, yeah. Yeah, so the, the operational semantics, the pros of the operational semantics is kind of like algorithmic, like, like, like you showed, it's this step this, step this, this, step this. The typing rules, the pros of that is really declarative. It's just like a bullet list of constraints. That doesn't give you immediately an algorithm, right? Um, for WASM 1.0, it pro wouldn't probably be too hard to derive an algorithm from that, but at least with WASM, like what we have now, we have subtyping. Right, so you have transitivity and all that, and it's a well-known problem that generating an algorithmic formulation of subtyping from a declarative one is not trivial, and you usually have to prove cut elimination and all that. So automating that is currently way out of scope. So what we do, though, is we generate the pros in, for the validation as well, for the type checking, but there is no execution of that, right? We don't have any interpreter for that. Um, so that's kind of, if you want, that's a bit of a missing piece there. Likewise, I think what we don't do yet but could do, I guess, is generating the, the parser. Yeah, parser is, yeah, it, that should be doable. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I, don't, I don't know much about uh, I wasn't, but just I was thinking about two sort of related approaches. I mean, in, in the um, instruction set architecture area and, and processor definition area, sort of Adam Chipala had a sort of similar um, plan about six or seven years ago. Um, so it might be worth talking, talking to him about that. And I was also thinking in, sort of for, for, for specifying execution models and, and properties about that. 30 years ago, there were these approaches of particular um, SOS formats, um, GSOS, generalized SOS, probably Philippa, you know much more about that. Um, but I was wondering whether this DSL uh, format at the very top sort of has relationships to that or whether that such structuring would help you sort of to derive additional reasoning principles. DSL. <laughs> well, so one thing I should perhaps explain is that the DSL itself really it's very general in some way, right? It, it really gives you only a way to define um, syntax or a data type, if you want, an inductive type, and, a re and relations. And then reduction relation is just one particular form of that we use for that. The typing relation would be another one. So on the DSL level itself, on the spec tech DSL level, you don't really have a notion of reduction at all or, or SOS. Um, but then the later phases, in particular, the that's where the animation comes in and um, that back and makes a lot of assumptions about how to interpret these relations. Um, mm -hmm. And that is kind of like what we get out of this approach, right? So, I mean, the other question you, sh you, you could ask is why don't we use something like art, which also is this form of DSL, which you can generate stuff from. Well, this is like doing our own thing allows us to specialize the hell out of it, right? We can just cut corners wherever we want. We just need to be able to handle the cases we care about. And that means, especially in the back end, it doesn't have to really be able to handle the general case. And I mean, you showed the a uh, AL abstract syntax, right? That's totally specialized to what we use. Well, um, right, and 
which is not in the in the front end actually. So mm -hmm. there there is at some stage in the pipeline we make assumptions about the structure of things and mm -hmm. don't bother dealing with other things. So two things to add is that one is the to really understand the current status of the DSL and everything, we need to actually write that in other forms. So one of my students tried to re rewrite the semantics in DSL in K and in PL3DEX. That's how we understood the um, differences between them, like the lack of some features in K and PL3DEX. And now he's defining the semantics of P4 written in Quark and Isabel in DSL. So that we can try to see whether DSL is enough to describe the even lower level of the semantics. And another thing is that um, Lucy and Amal and Luke and Andreas are working with this component model. And Lucy now has the formal specification of the semantics of component model. And one of my students is trying to describe that semantics in DSL again. Then now we are like <laughs> giving hard time to DSL. And it's designed to be general purpose and really high level. And we, th we believe that's going to be doable, but we will see how far it can go. I mean, yeah, but DSL is in a, in a way general, but also in, in terms of its feature set, it's just about what we need, right? It, exactly. It doesn't yeah. hardwire any of WASM specifics, but in terms of the feature set chosen, it's just what we need for WASM. Mm -hmm. Um, in particular, right now, there is no such thing as binders in the abstract syntax because WASM right now doesn't need it. So any language kind of semantics that has to do with binders will be a challenge, which is the case for the component model. But yeah, I think... Uh, I think yeah. So thank you for a really inspiring talk. Thank you. Um, following up on what Andreas just said, um, so I don't know which of you to ask, but we were shown this exception handling thing this morning, which requires capturing the evaluation context. <laughs> Does the DSL cover that, or will it be extended to cover that? That's an excellent question. So that's one of the things we still keep discussing, like what to do about evaluation context. So right now, without without um, continuations, we can get away with just having like this bubbling up semantics for for branches, which are just breaks, and also exceptions and return, which are the th three things. But with continuations, you can also formulate it that way, but it's kind of very tedious. You have to incrementally construct the, the evaluation context that represents your continuation. So basically, that, that's an open question right now, how we want to deal with that. And it might be that we want to build in special support for evaluation context, or we just say, like, okay, we just do this more um, cumbersome thing and be happy with that. I don't know. That's not so a different question. If you could go back to the slide where you had the DSL and then the expansion into English prose. Mm, not this one. Okay. Right, so there's the expansion into prose. So that, that will now be part of the spec, right? Yes. The, the generated spec. And then can you go back to the DSL that generates that? Um, Conrad, I am not familiar with that Windows. <laughs> Thank you. And, and ooh. That's somewhere there. here is that this is AL algorithm right. representation. Right, but you don't write the AL, right? The AL is ah DSL. Sorry, right. DSL. Right. So that is so much more compact than the pros exactly. or the. Um, so this is sort of a question about pragmatics. It seems like if I wanted to review the thing, I'd be much better off reviewing that than the generated prose. Is, is, is the expectation that eventually nobody's going to read the prose? Or why is the prose there when this is so much better? Oh, so, uh, we have a yeah, I mean, I can say a lot about that, but maybe Tom's supposed to say Yeah, he first. Hi, I'm a software engineer. I work with a bunch of software engineers. They only want to read the prose. Exactly. They don't want to look at this. <laughs> I believe that. I understand that. But why? Oh. Uh, it's got a big horizontal line, and it's got some squiggly arrows, and like, what is that? You know? Could we do something that they read that's this compact? Context Maybe, but they're also the happy best. reading the prose. <laughs> 
So Angelus wants to have only this version, and usually developers do not want to look at it and have only Prose version. Everyone and, is different. And I think I can say concretely, very confidently, WASM would never have got industry support if we didn't promise to write the pros. So there's a pragmatic thing of needing to give the people what they want, even if they're wrong. No, I understand this is huge, pragmatic thing. <laughs> I was just going to say, so yeah, I'm also a software engineer, <laughs> and there's way more of us than there are people who speak this language. I tried my hand at teaching students this kind of thing with, with Jonathan co-teaching, and yeah, being able to speak the language in which the thing is written, which is, would be English in the generated prose, is very handy. So people can actually, they can read it and, and, the, and they can step through it. It's only when they get to the level of maturity where they understand the beautiful notation, will this make sense to them, but they don't initially. Uh, so I'm just going back to an earlier discussion. Uh, the thing about um, having an, a generalized uh, specification like OT, uh, I, I, I always make this point in this, these venues, um, we're not the only ones who's, who have observed that, that actually specializing is pragmatically, well, essential at the moment. So Peter Sewell, who is somewhere at this meeting, he did OT, but he was also involved in SAIL, which is essentially doing the same thing that we're doing with SpecTech, but for specifying um, processor architectures. So. And being SL, right, is it more specialized than just OT? Does SAIL have this bit of generating? Mike? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> ASL, I think, is not just on OT. So I guess, again, that's about really if you specialize, you can do Philip, you had your hand. It was going to be this ASL oh. concept. Okay. So, uh, so it, uh, and, and this, um, um. so, so coming from the mechanization uh, hat on, the um, often with these general purpose frameworks, you can automatically generate cot code or equivalent, but it's not what the people want. And it's not what those clock specialists want. So um, in particular, for what's going on with WASM DSL, it's absolutely to get to the, to the place where it is what we want. We actually sort of know the target because we've done the work already. And now it's can we back design to get what we need to then do the proof. And I imagine there's going to be similar stories in uh, Suk Young's world, uh, I just can't pinpoint it, of if one went general, you could do this with respect to prose, but that's not the same as being specific to, uh, um, to the particular target in hand. And actually, it will be quite good to pull out some of these ideas and sort of really grab at why staying absolutely in the WASM world for this DSL is really helping us. That's the... Uh, on that theme, one difference here in the generated text versus like what we have today for, for this binary operator example is I think what we have today is like if binop of C1 and C2 exists and then the generated text here it says if length of binop of C1 and C2 is 1, right? So there's just like that tiny difference. Obviously it doesn't make much of a difference. Is that... So we are. So that is something you plan to change yeah, yes, and make it more similar to what we have today. Right. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, I was wondering, like, how far are you going to go to make it exactly what we have today versus something that's... Very close. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say the main balance is between trying to get as close as to what we have today, but also making sure the code base is maintainable. It should be the case that because we're specializing for WASM right from the start and always having that in mind, we should be able to get very close to what we have today. But not at the cost, I think, of building in a hundred hacks that we then have to maintain in future. So mm. I think it's, it's not going to be the case that we throw the baby out with the bathwater to get exactly the same. But at the, the very least, things like that, we should be able to get the same without right. compromising on the, the rigor of our coding. Right. So currently, there's almost no hack in generating pros. And we are willing to add some tweaks about these things. I can imagine we even start out with a couple hacks so that's more similar and then yeah. move them over time. Yeah, right, right. I mean, there are not that many differences. Well, I mean, yeah. so, some of these things are kind of like syntactic patterns that are used in, in the spec right now, right? And they are 
so that you minimize the number of special constructs that the spec formalism needs, but there are certain patterns, and I think in the pros, you spell these patterns differently because it makes sense, right? Um, and I think the, the pros generator can, like, there aren't that many of those, I think, so it makes total sense to do. Okay, I think we need to move on because we are already well into the break. Do we have a very quick question, Phil? Like, it's not 